Hello, everybody. Welcome to Couchbase Connect 2020 session on how to build modern multi-tenant applications using collections and scopes. My name is Shivani Gupta. I'm Director of Product Management at Couchbase for the server. This is one of the features that I've been working on for the past couple of years, and I'm excited to talk about it with you today. We will soon be going beta in release 7.0 with collections. Beta should be coming out sometime in November 2020, so please watch out for the announcement. We do have a limited de developer preview available in the current release 6.5. So if you wish to try out some subset of the functionality that I'm going to talk about today, you can do so today using the 6.5 release. All you have to do is turn on the developer preview switch, and then you can start using collections and scopes. Bear in mind, not all of the functionality that I'll be discussing today is available in the developer preview. A subset is, and there is documentation available on what that subset is. So with that, let's get started talking about this. Today's talk is fairly high level and introductory. So I'm gonna keep things at a very conceptual level and try and give you an overview of what to expect when collections become available. I'm also gonna try and discuss some of the benefits you can obtain for your applications or on how you deploy and operate them if you start using this functionality. We will also talk a little bit about upgrade and migration since many of you may be having existing couch-based clusters that you would like to migrate. That's roughly our agenda for today's session. So what are collections and scopes? Collections and scopes are logical containers within a bucket. So today in a couch-based cluster, you create a bucket, which is basically a physical container, and then you start storing your documents inside the bucket. With collections and scopes, you will have two additional levels of containers within a bucket. If you're an application developer, you can use these to organize your data inside a bucket and to isolate your schemas. What I mean by schemas here is types of documents. Schemas do not imply any rigid, uh, rigidity of fields as you still get to enjoy the flexibility of JSON. But you can organize your data into separate collections and each collection can contain similar documents. If you're an application administrator or an operator, you can use them to consolidate your microservices and on your tenants if you're a multi-tenant application. So at a high level, what collections and scopes bring to you is not only logical containers and separation of your keys into uh, additional uh, containment levels, but also access control and lifecycle management at finer granularity than just a bucket. So number one, you can separate your schema and index each collection separately. The keys of collections need to be unique only within a collection. So you do not need to worry about using the same document key across multiple collections because um, each, each collection is a separate logical container. You can create and drop collections independently, scopes independently, or even a bucket. When you drop a scope, it drops all the collections inside the scope. When you drop a bucket, it drops all the scopes and their underlying collections inside the bucket. You can manage the maximum time to live, which we call TTL, and this determines how long documents will live in a uh, bucket before they expire. You can manage this expiration time at collection level in addition to the existing bucket level. So this gives you flexibility to set expiration for your collections independently. We're also going to have stats available at collection and scope level so that you can monitor these, ind these entities independently. The entire spectrum of stats, which we have today, will continue to be available at the bucket level. Collections and scopes will expose a subset of those stats, such as number of items in the um, collection, 
uh, the memory use by the collection, the disk size of the collection, um, number of operations per second um, on the collection, and these will be aggregated up to the scope level. Uh, security control via role-based access control will be available at these additional levels, and I will talk more how this will work um, when, when you have three levels of hierarchy. XTCR, which is our cross data center replication, is often used to either set up a disaster recovery uh, strategy or to have data local to geo-distributed users or to just simply scale your reads and writes by having um, certain parts of your data replicated to multiple clusters. Um, with collections and scopes, not only can you set up your replication at bucket levels, now you can do it at these additional levels as well, along with the ability to remap and or filter subsets of these data. Similarly, with Backup Restore, you can use our couch-based tools, CB Backup Manager and CB Backup Restore, to um, manage your backup strategy at any of these levels. So you do not need to back up a whole bucket if you don't need to. You can just back up some subset of collections. And again, you can apply filters. You can, uh, while during restore, you can um, name them to, uh, restore them to differently named entities on the target. So a lot of flexibility is available with, with um, how you want to set up your application and lifecycle management around these entities. So let's look at an example of what your collections might look like. Couchbase comes with a sample bucket called travel sample, which some of you might be familiar with. So let's imagine that once uh, Saveno is out, let's imagine that the travel sample bucket is now called travel, uh, just for the sake of um, discussion here. And let's say we decide to have two different scopes inside it. One is for all the bookings that were made and another scope may be for all the payment information uh, from various customers. So today, if you um, have noticed, the documents uh, are of different types. We store a lot of information about airlines, hotels, airport routes, since it is a travel sample, travel um, uh, data. Uh, these documents are differentiated based on type field. So once we move to 7.0, there is no need for a type field. We would put each of these different types of documents in their own collection. So there might be an airline collection, a hotel collection, airport collection, and a route collection inside the booking scope. Um, also, uh, note that it is not necessary to use scopes. If you just want to have one level hierarchy, you can just use the default scope, which is going to be automatically there in every bucket. So, you, you know, you, you can create a bucket and then you can just start creating your collections inside the bucket and these will go into the default scope if no scope is explicitly specified by you. Role-based access control. So let's see how this is going to work with these additional levels. So we have out-of-box roles available at the bucket level in today's uh, 6.5 version of Couchbase. With 7.0, you will have out-of-box roles available at multiple levels, including collection, scope, and the existing bucket roles. Uh, the role assignment will be hierarchical. So if you assign a role at a higher level, it is automatically percolated to lower levels. So let's look, in a, look at an example of what that means. So going back to the example we saw with the travel bucket on the previous slide, um, which has a booking scope, a payment scope, and some collections in each of these scopes. Now let's imagine I have a user A and I give it the writer role on the entire bucket. So what happens is this user automatically inherits writer role to all the collections in both the scopes. So it's, it's, um, uh, it's inheriting it through the scope to the collections. Now, if I have another user B to whom I want to give slightly lower privileges, I only want them to be able to um, 
access booking scope, not the payment scope, because that's uh, maybe more sensitive data restricted to certain users only. I could just give user B reader role, for example, to bookings. And this way it gets reader automatically to all the collections inside the booking scope. Now, let's say at a later point, I decide that user B needs to write to the airport collection. I could just assign it, write a role to the airport collection. So previously you would have had to assign it, write a role to the entire bucket. So now you have control over these things at a much finer level, which lets you um, control access um, uh, more tightly. So um, now let's talk a little bit about XDCR, cross data center application, how that might work with um, these new levels. So on this slide, I'm showing on the left a um, Couchbase cluster, which is named East. And inside that, I have a CRM application deployed, and the bucket is called CRM East. I'm also putting my staging data here inside a scope called staging, and my prod data inside a scope called prod. This, uh, this simple uh, application has two collections orders and accounts. Notice these collections exist in each of the scopes because both staging and prod have the same services deployed. Now, let's say I set up another cluster, Couchbase Cluster West, to start replicating some of these of this data for um, um, locality of reference or to lower my latencies or maybe just to have uh, high availability and uh, hot standby for um, uh, in case of uh, you know, uh, disaster scenarios where you lose the whole East cluster, I want to replicate some of my most important data in Couchbase West cluster. So let's say I decide I don't want to put staging data and I just want to replicate my prod data and that too I want to begin just with the accounts collection because maybe that's my most important piece of data. So I've set up a cluster on the West with just the prod scope and I created accounts collection. Now, in order to set the XDCR replication, I have many choices. I could just choose to set it at the collection level. So I created application from um, CRM East bucket dot prod dot accounts and I map it to accounts collection on CRM West dot prod dot accounts. So this replicates just this collection. And when I'm setting this up, I could choose a different name for my West collection. It doesn't have to be the same one. It could have been called global accounts or any such thing. Additionally, I could also specify a filter. I could say, um, you know, just replicate the accounts which have been, uh, which have a create date of uh, uh, post uh, January 1st, 2020, something like that. Um, so you have lots of flexibility in how you set up your replication. I could also set, up, set it up at scope level. So I could replicate the entire scope. And even though I just have the accounts collection, what will happen is that XDCR, when it first tries to replicate orders, it will discover there is no orders on the target. It will log an error message in the UI saying this collection is missing. But after that, it will just uh, continue replicating the accounts collection. And at some point down the line, if you do create an orders collection on the prod scope in CRM West, XDCR will discover that and immediately start a backfill of orders from uh, East and uh, make sure all the data on West is caught up with that. Again, you could have also set it up at entire bucket level. And um, in that case, your entire bucket is replicated. So there is a lot of flexibility available with how you use XTCR um, with, with this um, um, bucket, scope, and collection hierarchy. So let's talk a little bit about numbers. Um, those of you who are already using Couchbase, um, might be aware that in a couch-based cluster, you can create um, um, 30 buckets maximum. 
buckets are heavyweight, they are uh, physical entities, uh, there's a lot of um, resource management that goes on with them. Hence, um, we uh, keep the maximum number of buckets uh, uh, at that. Um, with collections, um, you can create orders of magnitude more. So basically, uh, what we're saying in 7.0 is that you can go up to 8,000 collections per cluster. Now, why 1,000? It's uh, why not more? Uh, the answer is we could allow more, but this is what we are testing with in 7.0, because as you can imagine, having these um, uh, orders of magnitude more entities places a very different kind of uh, burden on all the underlying components of Couchbase. And there is major rewrite going on of many areas, such as um, how we keep metadata, how we keep and manage statistics, um, how we uh, keep global secondary indexes. So there's a lot of uh, pieces that are being reworked to support very different magnitudes of scale. And in 7.0, we will support 1,000 maximum collections per cluster. At some point, this may be revisited. So now if you're going to use scopes to organize your collections, uh, you may typically have a handful of collections inside each scope. So we anticipate that your scopes will be ranging from a few couple of hundred to maybe a maximum of 1,000 if you just choose to create a scope and have one collection inside. So the maximum of 1,000 scopes per, collect, per cluster will also be enforced. Now, once you've created your collections, you probably want to um, access them using uh, NICL, uh, which is a query language very similar to SQL. So chances are you'll create indexes on some of the fields in each collection. So it may be, um, you know, it may range from anywhere one index on a collection, or you may have a lot of query access patterns so you may want to uh, have six, seven, eight, maybe you know, 10 indexes on certain collections. So what we're going to do is we are uh, increasing the limit of number of global secondary indexes that you can create to 10,000 per cluster. So that's a lot of indexes for a single cluster to manage. But this is uh, what 7.0 will let you uh, do. Okay, so now we have some sort of idea of what this functionality is all about. Let's talk about how you can benefit from using collections. So number one, if you're map bringing a RDBMS application to Couchbase, your mapping from RDBMS to Couchbase is now uh, simplified further. Number two, if you're using a microservices architecture, which is very popular these days, you can consolidate a lot more microservices in a single couch-based cluster and achieve higher application density. And number three, if you have a multi-tenant uh, application, a SaaS kind of application, now you can host a lot more tenants uh, if your requirement is for soft multi-tenancy, and we'll talk about it further down, uh, you can host a lot more tenants in a single cluster using uh, collections. So, you know, you have much lower TCO, uh, total cost of ownership uh, by using um, this uh, mechanism of hosting your multi-tenant applications. So let's start with talking about um, the mapping from RDBMS to Couchbase and look at that a little more first. So what collections and scopes allow you is to retain your data organization that you may have in the RDBMS world while enjoying a flexible JSON schema, right? So what does this mean? So RDBMS is typically single server, couch basis scale out cluster. So I guess that mapping is obvious. A RDBMS server maps to a couch based cluster. A database um, in, inside an RDBMS server maps to a couch based bucket. So you can create you know, one or more buckets inside a cluster. Now, what you would uh, call as tables in RDBMS is what a collection is in couch base. And in, in RDBMS, you store rows inside a table. In Couchbase, you store documents, either JSON or binary, inside your collections. 
what we have is also an additional level called scope, which is um, called schema in some RDBMS. It's, it's an overloaded term because it's not really about the type of the documents. It's more about um, organizing uh, tables by um, user or things like that. So we did not like the term schema very much as it has uh, many different meanings. So we chose to call that level where you group multiple collections together, similar to grouping multiple tables as scope. So you get cluster, bucket, scope, collection, and inside a collection, you store your documents. So let's walk through a simple example of, um, you know, using nickel to, nickel is the query language to create um, collections, store some documents, create indexes, and then do a query to retrieve data according to a certain requirement. So what I'm showing here is um, simple statements to first create a bucket. I'm calling my bucket CRM for my CRM application. Then next what I'm doing is I'm setting the query context. And by setting the query context, what happens is that anything I do after that from any of our tools, which you could use to access Nickel, it is always within the context of that, um, that namespace. So here I'm saying set my query context to CRM dot underscore default. So the first uh, part of the path is the bucket, the second, the um, scope. So I'm setting the scope to the default scope. And then I'm, um, whatever I do is then next happening in CRM buckets default scope. So you can set the query context either from uh, any of the SDKs if you're using a, if you're writing an application using one of the SDKs or if you're using the query shell to do some queries, you can set it in the query shell. Uh, or if you're using the query workbench from the UI, you can set it in the query workbench. So it's available in, in all the um, various uh, tools you would use to run your queries. Next, what I'm doing here is I'm creating two simple collections uh, within the CRM application, orders collection and individuals collection. Now what I wanna do is insert a, a document each in both these collections so that I can just run a simple query to do something with these documents. So first I'm inserting a document into the individuals collections with an ID of 110, name, email. Next. I'm uh, making an order which was placed by this individual with ID 10, 110. I'm storing the um, ID of this individual as a foreign, as a reference in, in this orders document uh, in the field called end ID. Uh, so it says 110. So there is an order made by um, the individual with an ID 110. They ordered shoes and that's stored in this array of items. So um, notice how there is no type field in e either of these documents because they're both separate co collections. The collection implies the type, so there is no need to have an explicit type. Next, I wanna create some indexes because I anticipate that I'm gonna do some queries by, like trying to retrieve orders made by individuals. So I create an index on orders on its reference individual ID to the uh, individual's collection, and I create an index on individuals on its primary key of ID. So now that I have my indexes, I basically want to retrieve all orders made by, all, all items ordered by any individual. So I write a simple joint query where I reference the, where I select from the orders collection, join it with the individual collection, on the reference individual ID to the primary key of the individuals. So it looks very much like a SQL query that you may write in an RDBMS. Hence the friction from, for you to migrate your queries from RDBMS to Couchbase is further reduced by organizing your data in collections. So I executed this query in um, the UI query workbench. This is what it looks like. I just inserted two, one document in each of the collections. So my result set just contains uh, one document, which is the items ordered by uh, Mary Jo. It's a pair of shoes. So this is what my query um, and its results look like in, in the uh, 
12 workbench. So just putting it all together, this is what we did to work with collections using Nickel. I set the context using the default scope. I uh, created a bunch of collections. I inserted the JSON documents into my collections. I created indexes. And then I ran a query, which does a join on both the collections. Those of you who have been using Couchbase might quickly um, uh, notice that previously you uh, would have additional predicates using type in order to subselect the types of documents uh, for both individuals and orders. So none of that is necessary anymore. You just refer to the collections um, directly. So a lot of this benefit that Nickel uh, gets from um, your applications using collections is uh, syntactic. Uh, but it does not stop there. There is actually a lot of uh, benefit to be obtained in terms of performance uh, for the indexing pipeline. So as you know, Couchbase has global secondary indexes in order to give you flexibility of access patterns of how you want to do your queries. So because of global secondary indexes, you're not, uh, you don't, uh, you do not have to bear the burden of uh, choosing right uh, sharding keys up front because no matter how you shard, which is automatic for Couchbase anyway, uh, during query time you can define an index based on your access pattern and uh, only the data selected by indexes is, is, is read from, uh, from the data service. Uh, what this implies is that query global secondary indexes have to receive the data when you insert it in order to build indexes and do the ongoing maintenance. Um, so with collections, with your data being organized in our collections, the indexer processor processes only receive relevant data due to filtering at source. Um, so previously, if you, everything was in the same bucket, the indexing pipeline would have to read the entire bucket. And then uh, there was filtering up front at the projector, what we call the projector. but. Uh, it would still have to do work to uh, read everything and just uh, process uh, what is relevant for each index. Now the filtering can happen at the what we call the data change protocol. DCP itself and indexing just needs to receive data that is relevant, relevant for a given index. So in this little example that I have here, so let's say I have one data service node again with uh, the four collections that we have been talking about all this while, airport, hotel, airline, route. And um, let's say I set up two indexer nodes. What the first indexer node is building an index on the airport collection and the hotel collection. And the second indexer node is building a, um, a building indexes on airline collection and route collection. So the first indexer node uh, receives uh, mutations just for those two collections and the second one just receives mutations on airline and route. Um, and this, this filtering is happening very early on resulting in uh, lower CPU consumption and resource consumption for indexing as well as um, a lower latency. So indexes can catch up a lot faster with what's happening uh, in terms of mutations at the data service layer. So now let's switch gears to microservices. Um, microservices are very popular pattern for applications these days because they enable um, very agile de development. They enable um, uh, you know, splitting applications into simple single concern uh, services which small teams can work on uh, independently. Um, and these are loosely coupled uh, so that they can be developed, deployed, secured, scaled independently. So these are some of the typical requirements which microservices need from uh, whatever data source they choose to store their data in because that's how the entire microservice needs to behave. So with collections, we are uh, providing a highly scalable option to deploy microservices in addition to uh, what you might have been using buckets or other, other ways to do. So why is that? So firstly, um, by storing data for microservice inside the collection, you can develop independently because each collection 
is logically isolated. Its keys need to be unique only within the collection. So you don't need to, you only need to know data about, about worry about what's going on inside your collections. You don't need to worry about collisions of keys or names or anything um, with other microservices. Um, you can also deploy independently, like we talked about, you know, managing life cycle, either through backup restore or just simple create drop for each of these collections independently. So you can upgrade, revise, um, you know, manage these um, uh, microservices independently by storing their data in separate collections. Security. So it's very important to be able to um, assign users privileges to each microservice separately because some different sets of users will be able to access different microservices. And we are role-based access control that we talked about, which is now available at collection level. You can control access at each microservice separately without giving access to the full bucket. And also there is uh, ability to scale independently via XDCR replication. So as we saw, you can set up XDCR at the level of each collection. So what this means is that if there are certain collections belonging to microservices, which need, uh, you know, which um, maybe need to have more uh, local access to data, you can have more geo replication for them to a cluster that you may set up uh, local to the users in a different uh, uh, geo, or you can um, even, um, if, if this application is growing a lot, you can even eventually XDCR, uh, move it out via XDCR to its own uh, separate cluster. So, um, you know, using XDCR at collection level with, with the collection being microservice gives you um, quite a bit of leverage in just scaling a subset of microservices versus scaling everything in the bucket. Um, so uh, this is how, um, this is an old pattern that many of our uh, users have been using in order to put their microservices inside Couchbase. So what some people do is they create a bucket and then store documents for each microservice inside the same bucket and use their own type field to um, differentiate between different documents. So this, this puts a lot of burden on the application because there's no isolation across microservices. It, it works, but the application has to do the heavy lifting of uh, managing the data um, that belongs to each microservice. Another pattern that has been in use is to use a bucket per microservice. Again, um, this provides isolation, certainly, maybe more than you need. Um, so um, in this example, I have uh, sales uh, microservice and sales bucket customers and uh, customers bucket, but this does limit the number of microservices per cluster to uh, 30 because that is our bucket limit. So now with microservice with collections, what you can do instead is you can create a collection for microservices. So as we said, microservices are simple, right? So they usually have a single concern. So one collection is usually going to be enough to store the data of a microservice. So what I have here is now I've split my orders, uh, collections, shipping collection, individuals, accounts, and presumably each of these are mapping to a microservice that is going to give um, access to its users by giving access to the collection only. And this way you can have up to 1000 microservices per cluster. So that's a lot of microservices. It enables you to pack a lot more into a single couch-based cluster. Um, you know, presumably it helps you in utilizing your uh, cluster capacity and lowering um, your total cost of ownership. Another possibility is that you may have microservices that are related, you know, to, uh, to, at the, to a high level application. So you may want to put those together in a bucket. Uh, that way you, you can scale the bucket because bucket is still the physical um, resource uh, allocation unit. So if you want to give more RAM to a certain set of microservices or 
bump up the CPU priority, you would do that via a bucket. So um, in this, you know, orders and shipping are my uh, collections from the sales uh, application. So I put them in, in, in a separate bucket from individuals and accounts, which are my customers bucket. So you could do this as well. So really a lot of flexibility on how you want to organize the data for your microservices um, using these patterns. So you're no longer restricted to, you know, either just using a bucket or doing it all in your application layer. Um, let's talk a little bit about multi-tenancy because we believe collections are going to be very valuable for many of our users to lower the TCO by enabling them to host a lot of tenants inside uh, the same cluster. So multi-tenancy is a complex art and there is no one size fits all kind of solution. And most uh, practitioners pick their own from a whole spectrum of available solutions uh, by choosing their own trade-off between TCO and isolation. Some solutions provide more isolation, but they come with a higher total um, cost of ownership, whereas solutions which um, uh, have lower total cost of isolation uh, ownership may not provide as much solution. So based on your requirements of, uh, you know, of the kind of tenants you're hosting, you may have different uh, choices you want to pick from. So um, in Couchbase, now you have uh, many different choices. You can choose different clusters. You can use different buckets for your tenants and now scopes and collections. So clusters obviously provide you the highest isolation, but they do provide you um, a high TCO as well because you have to set up a cluster for each collection. So uh, each uh, tenant. So basically it's the choice is yours. Uh, we offer you another low cost choice with scopes and collections so that if, if that level of isolation is sufficient for you, then you can host your each tenant in a separate scope slash um, collection. So this is the full picture of what these different approaches provide you in terms of uh, scale. Um, TCO, resource isolation, access uh, security isolation, logical namespace isolation. So on the top is the option to use a separate cluster per tenant. So obviously this gives you the best isolation. You have resource isolation, security, namespace, everything, but you know, your TCO is high. At the bottom is homegrown um, app, purely application controlled isolation where you're just uh, putting all the data for all the tenants in a single bucket and just separating it out with a type field or, or a key prefix. So you have absolutely no isolation, not even uh, logical or namespace isolation and you're managing it purely in the application layer. So between these two extremes, you have uh, many other choices uh, up till now buckets, now scopes and collections, right? So with using a separate bucket, you could at most host 30 tenants in a cluster. Uh, so your TCO is a little lower than using a separate cluster and you still get some resource isolation because you can set RAM quotas per bucket, you can set uh, CPU priority of buckets, and of course you get uh, security and namespace isolation. But by using a scope per tenant or maybe just directly using a collection per tenant, depending on your needs for data organization, you can bump this up to a whole new level of being able to host 1,000 tenants per cluster. So this really brings down your TCO quite dramatically. What you give up is resource isolation. So you do have security isolation. So using role-based access control, you can assign users of specific tenants um, permissions to just their data. They do not see, they do not have to see data of the other tenants. And of course you have um, namespace slash logical isolation. So your keys won't collide, um, you know, your um, namespaces don't collide. So you have all that good stuff. What you don't have is be the ability to control how much RAM each tenant uses or, um, you know, how much uh, disk or memory. But you can monitor these stats because there will be stats available per scope and collection. So you can monitor how much each collection and hence how much each tenant is using. 
and set up your own alerts based on any rogue tenants and, and such and, and take action appropriately. So going back to our favorite example of the CRM application, in the previous um, slide when we were talking about microservices, I had shown that each collection maps to a microservice such as orders, shipping, individuals, accounts. Um, so this is how we had set it up. Now let's say I suddenly need to make this application, a multi-tenant application, because I'm going to become a SaaS provider. So what I could do is I could simply start using scope. So I could use scope per tenant. So now I have the same collections, um, orders and shipping uh, created for each tenant. And the data is completely isolated, completely separately secured. Each tenant's users see only their data. So this way I get a combination of microservice, tenants, all within the same cluster. And you know, I can, I can um, uh, have scale of uh, thousands of uh, tenants slash microservices. Um, so hopefully um, that was uh, useful in terms of how you can benefit from uh, migrating your, from using collections and scopes uh, once uh, we release them in 7.0. Um, so now naturally the question that may come to the minds of some existing users is, well, how am I going to upgrade my existing data and upgrade and migrate uh, to this new world of collections? So firstly, um, on upgrade, so let's say you're on 6.5 and you upgrade to 7.0, what will happen is that every bucket in 7.0 will have a default collection. And this default collection will live in the default scope. So during upgrade, all your existing data will move to the default collection in the default scope of the same bucket. What this means is there is no impact to existing applications. So if you don't want to use collections, you do not have to do absolutely anything. All your existing SDK applications um, will continue to work as is because any reference to the bucket, which is probably how you do it today, will automatically map to the bucket name dot default scope dot default collection. So everything continues to work as is. So there's nothing to worry. Upgrade will not break anything in your existing applications. However, you probably want to start using named collections. You don't want to live with all your data in the default collection. You want to start using collections in order to avail of all the benefits that we just talked about. So what are your various options for migrating your existing data? Um, there are many options, uh, both online and offline. So if you want to do, if your application cannot afford any downtime, you can use cross data center replication to set up another cluster where you can start migrating your data to using all the features we talked about, uh, remapping and filtering. If your application can uh, afford to have little window of downtime, you may choose to do it via backup and restore. And again, both these provide um, very flexible and um, rich filtering and remapping capabilities which will make it easy for you to do so. And I'll show you one simple example, and we'll have a lot more uh, details on this uh, once we are ready for beta with upgrade and migration guides. So a common migration scenario is, um, you know, I have my data all in single bucket and I'm using key, pre key prefixes or type fields to separate out data of different types. And now with collections, what I want to do is I want to put each of these different types of documents in their own collection. So this is going to be a pretty common data uh, mapping scenario, we, uh, we think. So uh, what might one do? So let's look at um, doing this with backup and restore. And it's going to be very similar using XDCR. So going back to our travel sample bucket, which is available uh, with Couchbase clusters out of box. Uh, let's say we upgrade to 7.0, right? So all the travel sample data moves to the default collection in the default scope. So what I'm doing here is I'm using CB Backup Manager to take a backup of the travel sample bucket in a upgraded 7.0 cluster. Next, what I want to do is I want to take the airport documents 
from the default collection and put them in their own named collection called airport. So what I'm doing here is in this CB backup manager restore command, I'm using the map data option to say travel sample dot underscore default dot underscore default, which means travel sample default scope default collection, map that to a new bucket called travel in which I have a scope called booking uh, in which I have a scope slash dot airport. In addition, I'm also saying auto create buckets if the bucket doesn't exist. And then I'm saying filter values by type where type is airport. So what this restore command is gonna do is it's gonna take only the airport type documents from the default collection and put them in airport collection. And then you can repeat this with, with the other documents, hotel, um, airlines, route, and so on and so forth. So this is just a demonstrative example of how you might do it. And with XTCR, it'll be something similar um, with uh, remapping and filtering capabilities for how you can migrate. So um, that's basically um, a very high level overview of uh, collections and scopes. And um, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, there is a limited developer preview, which is available in 6.5. So you can start experimenting today if you wish. Beta is coming soon with 7.0. It's planned for November 2020. So do look out for the announcement. We really look forward to receiving your feedback um, on beta. So look forward to you trying it. Um, that's it. And uh, thank you for attending um, my session today. Hopefully you found it useful.